everybody welcome back um so yes uh i hope you all got your refreshment um and um we are starting now with uh, the second part to, to the morning um so um just wait and see if wayne is here as well um i'll start by introducing you nick shall i um, so we have got uh, Nick and Wayne um, to uh, present the details project. Uh, Nick is Arts and Cultural Development Officer at Stevenage Borough Council. Uh, he has a background in art, fine art and cultural heritage and is also well travelled um, with USA, India and UK on his CV. Um, he uh, passionately believes uh, in culture as a vehicle for education, cohesion and quality. Uh, and he's currently leading on the Stevenage Arts and Heritage Strategy, uh, working on new town projects to particularly inform regeneration plans. So welcome, Nick. Uh, on to Wayne. Um, Wayne is a director and owner of uh, Collateral Head Architecture in London. He is a Reba Fellow uh, and is also an associate on the Design Council uh, and he serves on many panels um, across London and the UK. He has over 20 years experience in uh, healthcare, schools, housing and university architecture. Um, he's also got a passion for green and energy projects and is a member of the London Energy Transformation Initiative or LETI. Um, which is looking at approaches, targets and benchmarks so the UK can reach its net zero carbon targets. So impressive stuff. Um, OK, so I can see you, Nick. So over to you for the presentation. Thank you. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Shane. And uh, many thanks for the invitation. So um, over the last couple of years, a uh, partnership comprised of, of Shane Downer and Simon Pert at Milton Keynes, uh, Wayne Head and Gabby Watkins at Kurala Terrell Head Architects, and our Stevenage team have been undertaking a project that forms a, a new town's volume of CLTH's details publication. Oh, so I'll be referring to Kurala Terrell Head as CLTH moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. So this project aims to research, illustrate, and exhibit the Newtown story, primarily through the design heritage of our two bookend towns. When you consider how unfairly disparaged uh, Newtowns are, you could then consider this project a bit of target work to elevate appreciation of, of Newtowns. We also intend for this to inform future planning and regeneration, uh, but also seems really relevant for wider learning when you consider uh, the value of things like the 15 minute city, which new towns were a prototype of, or the value of a welfare state, especially during a time like a pandemic. Um, it's also important to mention that we won't cover the Milton Keynes half of this project during this presentation, partly because um, its story will be discussed elsewhere. Next slide, please. As many of you know, Stevenage was designated as the first new town. Uh, some of the prominent planners, architects, and engineers of their day were drawn to this progressive opportunity to design a, a new vision of a modern egalitarian society. Uh, as part of this, Stevenage created the world's earliest pedestrianized town center of its kind and scale. It seems Stevenage also created the world's first grade separated cycling and pedestrian infrastructure of its kind and scale, following some smaller or singular examples in places like Utrecht and, and Arnhem in Holland. Um, but this project is, is more focused on the pioneering architecture of Stevenage and Milton Keynes, which was much more than aesthetic. Um, their designs embodied the progressive social reforms of the, of the new town movement. And this also applies to public art, which is also highlighted in this project. I'd also like to add that CLTH is a, a very appropriate partner for this, uh, not just because they are the, the founder of this details publication, but because their practice is also, um, you know, in my opinion, extraordinarily progressive and, and socially conscious. So it's great to have them researching, illustrating, and uh, informing our work. Next slide, please. 
I'd like to start by providing a bit of context going all the way back to the Industrial Revolution, just to highlight its role in, in fostering uh, a new town movement or, or I, I should say a new movement in architecture centered on functional buildings uh, to meet new needs. So I'm talking about new building types like factories, warehouses, department stores, and, and office blocks, uh, which utilize new technology and materials in their designs. Our Crystal Palace is a, is a good example, which exhibited industrial creativity and technology with the building itself a showcase, um, a showcase of cast iron and, and sheet glass innovation. And the Great Exhibition of 1851 is also significant, um, especially for, for us in this project, uh, because it was the predecessor of the Festival of Britain a century later. Next slide, please. The Flatiron Building in New York City is an, another good example, which illustrates the use of steel to construct high rises. Um, and those high rises were often used for offices ab above a couple of retail floors. Next slide, please. Then the 20th century saw the emergence of uh, the modernist architecture movement um, with early examples that employed machine age technology and the emergence of uh, a European modernism like Bruno Tott's designs in uh, Falkenberg Garden City shown here. Uh, he played an important role in the, the Werkbund or the German, Associ excuse me, German Association of Craftsmen, um, which influenced the later Bauhaus school. And both these schools are important because they, they worked to integrate the arts, um, the various branches of the arts to mass produce functional quality designs through um, modern materials and, and machine production. Next slide, please. So that leads us then to the First World War and the devastation it caused, which coalesced with the growing socialist movement. And that created the international style in the interwar years. And architects of this style believed buildings should not only be functional, but that they should function to create a modern and, and classless society. So materials, uh, new materials and technology like steel, reinforced concrete, glass, and prefabrication were employed, uh, and designs rejected excessive ornamentation so that they could more honestly express a building's modern construction and function. And um, this seems to have symbolized social progress and machine age efficiency and quality designs for all. And so here you see the influence of the Dishdale movement um, at Garrett Rietveld's house which was very utopian and aimed to strip things down to their essence and fuse form and function. Next slide, please. So this is the Bauhaus School designed by its founder, Walter Gropius, which is very much that white box modernism and shows the use of glass to further expose a building's construction and function. Next slide, please. This one shows how the style really was international with work by Adolf Benz in, in the Czech Republic. Next slide, please. And of course, Le Corbusier's influence um, and Villa Savoy being that kind of perfect expression of his principles using reinforced concrete to free up the space and facade. Next slide, please. And the, um, the Scandinavian form of this style was especially functional. It was especially human in scale and used softer materials. And this was probably because um, these designs were often tied to social housing projects like these blocks in Stockholm. Next slide, please. This is a, another good example from, from Denmark. Next slide. So um, Britain was, was fairly slow to adopt modern architecture, um, but it seems bombing from the Second World War and new reforms to address poverty and hardship created a need for, for many new public buildings and houses. Um, and as we know, Stevenage was designated as the first new town following the 1946 Act. Um, and Hertfordshire County Council, which is now recognized as pioneers of the, the post-war schools rebuilding program, built hundreds of schools through um, what was modern, cutting edge prefabricated building systems. And one of their earliest schools, um, which was co-designed with York, Rosenberg, and Martel, uh, that practice, 
was the UK's first um, co-ed secondary school. Um, and that's um, Barclay School pictured here in, in Stevenage. Next slide, please. Uh, Jean Prouvé's work is also notable for its modular prefabricated structures, which provided efficient and cheap options, um, which were important in a, a post-war period short on materials. Next slide, please. Um, so again, referring to Britain's kind of progress, it seems it was during the 1951 Festival of Britain that the country formally adopted modern architecture through what was a, a nationwide exhibition of, of British ingenuity and creativity meant to generate pride and renewal following the wars. Um, and it featured buildings inspired by the international style, but with that traditional British twist uh, that we've become familiar with. Uh, the festival was also important for its approach to the public realm um, in which sculpture and murals were used as a tool for reinvigorating towns and public morale after the war. Next slide, please. So around this time, brutalism was beginning to emerge. Um, and this generation was determined to build for this new welfare state uh, so that it, it aimed to, to unify society into a collective equal whole. And they seem to have embraced and expressed modern materials, construction, and utility even more honestly. And this often resulted in, in massive concrete structures with, with rough textures and services left exposed. And my understanding is that this symbolized a strong working class society and a utopian ideal. And uh, Coventry is a good example of this soft brutalism. Next slide, please. So this takes us back to Stevenage, where the original master plan envisioned uh, a new town center surrounded by six neighborhoods. Uh, and in these residential areas, the more Scandinavian influences of the festival style were used, similar to Lansbury Estate at the Festival of Britain. And um, as you can see here in um, uh, one of Stevenage's earliest neighborhoods, Bedwell, that um, kind of Scandinavian festival style is, is employed. Next slide, please. Um, so the same architects that designed Barclay School that we talked about also designed Stevenage's first housing estate, which is sadly no longer, um, but their design was very progressive, showing um, some similarity with Corbusier's early brutalist housing units um, through use of raw concrete and modular units. Next slide, please. And the, the town center's first phase was uh, mostly completed by 1958. And this building here in the town square is a great example of uh, festival style building with, with Bauhaus influences. But it was more progressive than some of its predecessors like the Royal Festival Hall in that it rejected opulent materials. Um, the facade also shows the use of curtain walling and the town center is notable for its early use of this technology on a large scale in Britain. Uh, next slide, please. In areas where residences were above shops, architects again used the Scandinavian style of the festival style. So again, it's uh, more human in scale, softer materials um, and so on. Next slide, please. But crucially, the town center also shows the revolution toward brutalism through designs that used and honestly expressed modern materials and functions, especially experimentation with concrete frames and paneling. Um, and they also integrated colored paneling that uh, pays homage to the Dishdale movement, um, again, showing the integration of art and architecture during this time. Next slide, please. So this model from 1959 um, is shown to illustrate that the town center is considered very special for its unified design, um, which is because the first three phases from the original 1949 concept through the 1970s were led or overseen by Leonard Vincent's teams within the development corporation. Next slide, please. And this is a this is a, excuse me this is an example of a building that was designed and built outside of the development corporation, but Leonard's team still had the authority to ensure unity and in design uh, uh, integrity of design. 
Um, it's also a really good example of the festival style through its use of modern materials like a reinforced concrete frame, but still somewhat traditional in its use of decoration and materials like flint. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, an important aspect of uh, progressive Newtown thinking was the idea that mixed types of housing um, would accommodate diverse groups and a, a more classless society. So although Vincent put restrictions on the um, number of high rises, apartment blocks were built like the one shown here, um, which was an early UK example of the Swedish style point block tower following um, Harlow's The Lawn. And like many places in the town center, uh, public sculpture was integrated into the landscape um, and uh, references common themes like humanism, socialism, and art movements like Cubism. Next slide, please. And that's a good stopping point because that's really what it was all about, um, how modern buildings could create uh, a more egalitarian society. So Wayne, over to you. Well, thanks, Nick. You'll be a tough act to follow there. Um, if I could have my first slide, please, Simon. Thanks, so, and thanks also to Shane for the introduction. Um, I should also thank uh, architects Eleanor Hill and Gabriella Watkins for helping to produce these uh, drawings that you're about to see. And so, well, Details is, is a publication which has been running for some time now and is formed as a series of drawings and essays about, you guessed it, architectural detail. Um, and we, are, we go out into the field with students of architecture often and ask, well, what is good or bad detail? You know, can a good building have bad details and vice versa. And so I'm going to be talking to you about how details research converge with Nick's research in Stevenage today. Casting our minds back a little bit, we drew um, a, 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 well, a series of volumes really. Uh, the first edition focused on location and place, but the second one focused in on the architecture of Chamberlain, Powell and Bonn, who'd also been hanging out in those uh, days at the Festival of Britain. And we produced a set dedicated to the Barbican and Golden Lane estates. And we looked at the, in detail, at the texture of the famous concrete structures. We looked at pick hammered, jack hammered details, and we drew, we drew out the meaning of those in our, in our studies. We also noted that there was a story about one of the uh, partners discovering a mining tool at the Festival of Britain, which, was, which they purchased and was used to take the cover off concrete at the Golden Lane Estate to form this facade. If we could come forward, please, Simon, to details volume, there's two, the Barbican and Golden Lane, and thundering on to volume three, please. The next slide. And so, so shortly following that edition, we were uh, asked by the Focal Point Gallery uh, South End if we could draw, go out into the field and draw the architecture of Essex, and particularly from the modernist period, many, many of you will know of the workers' houses out in Silvertown around the Crittle factory that were built by the owner of that factory for, for workers. Um, this was a fantastic collaboration with, with Essex and we drew other civic architecture around the town and held tours. Next slide, please. That brings us around about to today's study with Stevenage. And here we are in the field, uh, carrying out our initial investigations, looking at the architecture in the flesh with Nick and other incredible volunteers, uh, heritage officers and counselors. And so this was a socially distanced tour, but really took the form of a dry run for the heritage trails that we hope the drawings will uh, help enable. And we noticed that the town had once been locally known as Silkingrad due to the Stevenage's political architecture, architect pushing ahead with plans for Britain's first post-war new town. We noticed while the uh, background art, uh, the beautiful bronze sculpture Joyride next to the clock tower. Thank you, next slide. And so we produced a series of, I think, uh, 12 building studies in, in, this, in this edition. Um, we're going to show you a couple of drawings from that set. Back to YRM again, the John Lewis Warehouse, 1964, with YRM architects, 
and Felix Candela uh, called in to collaborate here, a renowned Spanish-Mexican engineer and architect. And this is uh, his only UK work, but he's really often known as a structural artist and really made a significant contribution to modernist architecture through his work in developing what can best be described as thin shell concrete paraboloid structures. Next slide, please. And so Candela used this innovative upside down umbrella shaped roof, which he'd been developing across Mexico at the time for industrial and religious buildings. And here it is uh, arriving in Stevenage. Please go and see it. It's such a special building and authentic from this authentic designer. Uh, to the right, you can see a section through the building of the loading bay, which is still being used today by Costco. Next slide, please. It really is fascinating. So each upturned umbrella shape rests on a kind of concrete pillar at its apex and is raised slightly to the north to bring in light to the, to the workspace. Thank you. Next slide. Thundering on, uh, this is another study from the, from the pack of drawings. And so after World War II, the government had been investing in manufacturing uh, to, the, to extend domestic consumption, and revive the market, perhaps something we're doing again now. Um, the Future Development Council was set up in 49 and a developer by the name of Jack Pritchard, who also built the famous Isocon, uh, was involved in setting up this building. Uh, inside, they were going to make bent plywood furniture designed by Walter Gropius, Marcel Brewer and Wells Coates. Uh, it's known as the Furniture Industry Research Association Lab, uh, where furniture would be tested uh, for all kinds of standards. All about material efficiency. Can we have the next slide, please? And so it's really a fantastic building for Stevenage, another must on an architecture tour. And it has these incredible details which are formed in triangulated trusses with steel and pine, perhaps referring to in the next slide, please, detailing by James Sterling at the time. Um, but please do uh, get out to see this building. Next slide. I'm thundering along, but... Um, on this whistle stop tour, we should also talk about scenes from everyday life in Stevenage. And so Nick mentioned the incredible cycle routes. We, we've also been drawing some of these spaces. Next slide, thank you. Incredibly and brilliantly, you know, Stevenage is home to 250 cycle routes, which tally up to 7,000 kilometers of uh, cycle space. Eric Claxton is a name of note here who designed the network inspired by the Dutch infrastructure. But the architecture along the way, the public space is, is incredible and often features sculptures by William Mitchell in the underpasses. We'll see some more drawings in the next slide, please. As well, for those of you who are into public realm design and graphic design, there is this moment where you pass over the threshold into Stevenage Town Centre and there is handmade sculptural uh, artwork laid into the pavements. It's a really lovely. Next slide. Would love to, to slow down a little here, but I'm ski jumping on to underpasses decorated with William Mitchell's mural art, which feature football and moon landings and automobiles, really incredible work. Uh, Lots of geometric and abstracted stylized uh, sculptures, which stand very tall in the uh, landscape of Stevenage. Next, please. So we made a, you know, we've made a wide range of studies as part of this set, which we hope to produce as part of a map soon and then lead on to further Newtown studies inspired by today's speakers. Next slide, please. Just a moment on Milton Keynes. So we completed a set of drawings for Milton Keynes in parallel to Stevenage. Um, so 1967, Milton Keynes was a, a kind of world away from Stevenage in a way and looked towards, we think, proto high tech architecture with steel and glass buildings. So, so utterly different in its, in its material and detailed makeup. As you know, blocks and grid squares, 
uh, are of interest are the makeup of Milton Keynes, and perhaps they look to American influence. Uh, there are many uh, better experts than I on this call today. Next slide, please. And so at that time, I think around about that time, the beginning, so Rainer Bannum at the AA was taking plane loads of architects over to the USA. And we suspect that there may have been undoubtedly American influences coming into the design of, of um, Milton Keynes. And you can see this in the ideas of Bannum and his students. And in his famous book, Los Angeles. Next slide, please. Just, just a quick one on some of the details from Milton Keynes. The SBI kiln farm is maybe very topical for today, given its dry construction, its prefabricated facade, modular, stelvatite, plasticized panels, really fascinating, adaptable, customized units made in a, a nearby car factory we, we hear. Next slide, please. And finally, here we can see the point the Leisure Centre in Milton Keynes, which was the UK's first American multiplex cinema. And the centre was run by the American Movie Corporation with a number of UK premieres. But it, its structure is a kind of kit of parts, fascinating from the perspective of details, <coughs> a, zero, a mirrored ziggurat, decorated red steel frame. Thank you. Uh, that will be all from me today. Please see us at Pinterest, zero, zero details. Thank you, Wayne.